My name is Alex Castillo. I am a software engineer uh, at Netflix. Uh, I work for the partner platform. So we help uh, Netflix run on many, many devices so you guys can enjoy your shows. And uh, today, I'll be talking about high-performing charts in Angular 2. How many of you have used Angular 2? You're not allowed to say, Jeff. All right. Awesome. How many of you have done data visualization without or with Angular 2? Awesome. How many of you have done Angular 2 um, data visualizations in Angular 2? Yeah, one? All right. So, sorry, you can leave this room. I'm just kidding. Uh, great. So, today, I'm going to show you a few ways that you can get your data visualizations working in Angular 2. Um, so I've come up with a few examples um, that I'm going to be showing you today. Uh, one of them is uh, just using Angular 2 and just plain CSS. Uh, so no library, just leveraging Angular, uh, Angular 2's uh, power. Um, we're going to see a little bit of a very simple WebGL example. And then we're going to see some uh, a, a library, uh, a Canvas library that interacts with Angular 2 to uh, its lifecycle. Yeah, so I have developers get involved with the technologies that they love, and that's why I'm here today. Uh, hopefully, inspire you uh, to come up with some solutions to uh, great problems and share them with other people as well. Um, so my first example is for Angular 2 plus CSS. Um, there are no other dependencies other than this. Um, so why don't we just see first how it looks like, and then we can just walk through the code and see how it came together. Great. So this is just an example. Uh, of a uh, X number of bars moving up and down. I created a little function that basically generates random data um, well, with some randomized colors and, ra and random values between zero and one. So I don't have to walk you through that, but let's see how this works with Angular 2 and a little bit of CSS. First of all, um, maybe I should explain you why you could do, or you sh or you, when you could do Angular 2 and CSS with no library. Maybe your use case is very simple, and you only need to show some bar charts, whether they're uh, horizontal or, or vertical. So why add a full library uh, to do this for you uh, when you can have a very small, very lean, simple Angular 2 component that you can just reuse? So this is what we're going to see. This is what the syntax looks like. So after the component is ready. This is the way you can actually express it uh, semantically. Uh, as you can see, the, the element is, uh, is a bar chart. Uh, and I've added two uh, properties, um, or two attributes. One is uh, orientation. So you can uh, specify whether you want them to display vertically or horizontally. And then we have a, a data attribute. That is where you pass the data. Uh, because we only want this component to contain uh, the presentation, we want to be able to just pass the data the way it, is, it expects it, and then it should just do the rest. All right, so by the way, like something, uh, what I just show you, just all those bars moving up and down, creating a component with Angular 2 and CSS, I don't know how many lines of code do you think this takes? Just pure guesses here are welcomed. CSS and JavaScript together? It's just Angular 2 and CSS. A uh, hundred, okay. Twenty, all right. So let's just take it from twenty to a hundred, and let's see where we end up at. Okay, so this is our component metadata. As you guys can see, uh, we're importing components and input from Angular Core. Uh, this example runs in the latest uh, Angular final, uh, and in uh, as you can see here, we have a selector, which is exactly what I just showed you. Bar chart. Uh, we have a template URL, which is where we have our uh, HTML, our custom HTML for our template. And then we have some style URLs. I have no other dependencies. Now, I do need a class, right? And, this, and the class is as simple as having an input or having two inputs, one for the data and orientation. And as you can see here, this maps directly to our HTML attributes, so orientation and data. They're both inputs that we're defining in, uh, within our class. And then I have a function. This function basically takes a value 
uh, in this case, it will be from 0 to 100, right? Um, and it also, and based on the orientation of our input, right? So if orientation here is equal to vertical, uh, we're, we're creating a constant called axis that is e uh, going to be equal to y or x, depending on the actual axis value that we're passing. If it's vertical, it's going to be a y. If it's horizontal or actually anything else, it's pretty much going to be an x. Then we're using template strings. Are you guys familiar with te uh, template strings? Yes, sir. RxJS? No, this is just plain Angular 2 and CSS. Yeah. There's a what? Oh, the dollar sign. So the way template strings work uh, in ES 2015, 2000, yeah, 2016, ES6, is that uh, you use the backticks, right? And if you want to have a, a, va a value within that, uh, those backticks, you do a dollar sign, open brackets, and close brackets. And that's going to be, as opposed to using normal uh, ES5 concatenation, where you would do uh, scale plus axis. So in this case, scale, axis, parentheses, and the value is going to be equal to something like this. Scale. The axis, let's say, is x, parentheses, and then we're going to have the value, right? Let's say 4, and then we're going to close it. And that looks familiar, right? That looks like a uh, property of a function in CSS, right? And that's exactly what we're going with with this. Uh, is that clear so far? Yeah, we're basically parsing a string here. Yes. So. That being said, we only have one function here. This is all, so we saw all the JavaScript is basically these two slides, right? And now we're seeing the template. In this template, uh, we're using, we, we can see some Angular 2 specific bindings. In this case, we, we have ng class, as you can see. This is Angular 2. We have ng4, and I'm going to explain you the syntax here. Uh, we have ng style. Uh, how many of you guys are familiar with Angular 1? All right. So does this look familiar to you guys, the way you actually uh, use ng style in Angular 1? Uh, ng4, it, it will be equal or similar to an ng repeat, right? Uh, but in this case, you have led bar off data as opposed to um, bar in data. ng class is equal to orientation. I know this looks like a simple string, but orientation uh, is actually the value from our input orientation. So if you remember, orientation right now is equal to vertical. So what is this doing? This is actually creating a class attribute with the value vertical in our template. Um, this is iterating for all that data, which is actually just an array of objects with two properties. Um, one is the value and one is the color. Um, then we have an ng style which will be a style attributes. And uh, we have only two properties. We have a transform and we have a background. This is all we're passing. This is all we're given to that template when it comes to style, right? We have a class orientation vertical. We have a transform. We have a background. Now our get scale is going to be equal to uh, remember scale function, x or y, depending on the axis, parentheses, then the value. And the value, in this case, comes from bar. Our background is going to be the color generated automatically by that function that I have, or tomato, because why not? It's an actual color. Um, so that is the view, pretty much, for this uh, custom Angular 2 component, right? Now. Uh, some of the heavy lifting, I do have to say, is in the CSS side, because what, what's going to happen is that these bars, the DOM, right, we, we have LIs for around 30 bars, right? So we have like 30 bars, um, and we have only a transform and a background, right? We don't, we're not using height in here to dictate what is the height of the actual bar. Can someone tell me why we're not using height? Why, why, why are we using the transform in here? 
we're going to be doing an animation, but it's also because of performance. Transform and CSS3 are way faster than actual height properties. And there are many, many ways you can actually move or give it a different size. One is height, right? Uh, another one is uh, a scale, so you can scale the actual bar. It's not going to scale the actual width, the height of the property. It's going to scale um, in a transform CSS style. CSS, um, I'm, I'm leveraging uh, Flex. How many of you guys have used Flex here? Cool. All right. Is this kind of coming together now? So we have Flex. Um, and what I'm doing is that I'm using the viewport high and the viewport width because I want to fill this, the screen. And Flex I'm using so it actually di distributes the items evenly across the screen. Um, the bar is going to have a, flat, a Flex unit of one. We're going to have some transitions, very simple, CSS. Uh, and then I have some orientation specific uh, selectors. Uh, vertical or horizontal is a class bound to the list item, right? So for the vertical ones, we want the flex direction to be a row, right? Um, for the horizontal ones, we, we want the direction to be a column. Um, and aligning the items, uh, we're using flex end for vertical and flex start for the horizontal ones. Now, when it comes to the bar, we're actually using one viewport height. Can someone tell me why it's just one viewport height in this case? Fix IE Say again? Fix IE uh, nothing to do with IE. We can leave IE alone. Uh, you know, we've we given IE a very hard time in the past decade. Decades. Yeah, because our transform is based on a scale from 1 to uh, 0 to 100. So if we take 1 as the actual unit of um, percentage, right, it's going to be relative uh, to the actual viewport height. So each time we transform the scale, let's say by 50, it's going to grow by 50%. But we're using the viewport in this case. You can see how we can use different, uh, different units here, right? In this case, it's because it's full screen, but we can use different units here. Um, now, the origin, it, this is when it gets interesting. If you use transform, which we're using in the bar, you have the option to add a transform origin, which is where the transform is going to take place, or where it does it's going to start. We want to do it from the bottom. If we don't specify it, it's going to take it from the center, so the bars would grow both up and down at the same time, which could be very cool, right? That could potentially be another setting in our component. Um, the transform origin, when you have horizontal bars, you want it to go from the left to the right. So that's why we have our transform origin to the left. Well, so that is all that it took to create that component. Uh, I haven't counted the amount of lines of code, but I can tell you, say again? About 30, you counted? Well, thank you. All right, so not too bad, right? And uh, that's because of how awesome CSS3 is, but uh, all the heavy lifting that Angular is doing for us. So let me give you an example of changing the setting for our uh, component. So let's do horizontal. Great. Switch to the browser. Um, Angular CLI should reload this page for us. Or we can just do it ourselves. Oh, there you go. So that's how uh, an easy value uh, change can, uh, uh, can alter the presentation of this DOM chart. So can you guys see the, the benefits of having around 30 lines of code, or in this case, yeah, 30 li lines of code, a specific code, to having to load a library that could potentially interact with Angular, which we are going to see as well because that's also very important. Great. Any questions so far of how this is working? Good. All right. So that is done charts in a nutshell with Angular 2. Uh, in a kind of like simplified way, we could expand this to support um, if we want a specific color 
that could be a property bound to ng style as well. Um, great. So I want to show you a simple example of uh, WebGL. And the, the point of this example is actually start talking about the Angular component lifecycle. Um, because uh, in this example, we're going to be using Plotly. Plotly is a library that um, uses Canvas and it leverages D3 and it leverages also, I believe, 3JS in order to give you 2D and 3D data visualizations. So what I've done here, and by the way, all of this code is available if you go to the repos. I'm going to show you the slides so you can run it locally if you want. Um, let's see how it looks like in the browser first. Ignore the red. I have no idea what that happened. All right. All right, there you go. Um, this is a very, very, very simple WebGL example where you can actually see in three dimensions the data that I'm getting. Uh, the data is not very relevant for this talk. I'm going to show you how I'm loading it in, uh, in the first place. What I want you to see is how I created a component in Angular 2 that is going to be expressed in the following way. Like this. I'm keeping it very similar and consistent to the previous example. In here, as opposed to uh, a bar chart, we have a chart 3D. We have data. Um, in this case, we don't care about the orientation, but a layout uh, would be uh, important. Now, have in mind that everything visually about this chart is being managed by Plotly. So data, we're uh, giving it to Plotly, and the layout, we're giving it to Plotly in the way Plotly expects it. So in this case, it requires for you to know uh, the Plotly API for like the layout settings and all of that. This is the template that we're going to be using. This is WebGL. Uh, it's only going to use a container. Uh, Plotly is going to be in charge of uh, injecting um, the necessary, let's say, canvas elements and all that. This is the um, component imports and metadata. So as you, as you can see here, we're doing component again. We're using input. Uh, we're using element ref. In this case, we're using element ref, and I'm going to walk you through it. Why? But then we're also using two uh, lifecycle hooks, on init and on changes. Um, there are some more uh, lifecycle hooks that I'm, I might or might not cover today. But in this case, you can see that we're only using a selector and a template URL. Of course, we don't need any CSS. This is pure Canvas and WebGL. Uh, can someone tell me why I called the chart 3D and not 3D chart? So, yeah, can I start with a number? Um, Exactly. So our class, this is uh, our class is actually very small. Uh, so, oh, something that I didn't mention was the declare. In this case, I'm just declaring. This is TypeScript, so I'm declaring uh, the plotly variable globally. Uh, there are other ways of going around this. In this case, it's just because uh, of of the types of of the typings. Great. So we have a custom property called plot element. We have uh, we're implementing it on init, and then we have um, dependency injection here in the constructor. And what we're doing is that we're actually using our element ref that comes from our imports right here. We're creating an instance of it, right? And we're calling it view. Then we have two inputs, data and layout. And remember, these inputs are exactly how we are passing data to the components. Because components, they have inputs and outputs. These components that you're seeing today are all about, all about passing inputs. Uh, they're not emitting 
any outputs or any events that we have to, that uh, we should be listening to, but that's totally something that Angular 2 can handle and was designed for. Okay, so on our ng on init uh, component lifecycle hook, we're taking our plot element that was previously declared, not defined. Now we're defining it um, with the view that comes from the element reference, right? The element reference has a property called native element that pretty much gives you the element um, of the component, that, that, that template, that view. If you remember when you're creating a directive in Angular 1, you have, let's say in the link function, you have an element available. This will be kind of similar, right? We have a native element. And then I'm just querying within my template. I only have one element, but I'm doing a query selector plot. So basically, I'm just uh, querying the only element that I have in my view, which is plot. I have a container here. So what am I doing? I'm saying, OK, the ng uh, on init is, gonna, um, is going to execute um, once the component um, that let's say is, is ready, right? And we are, now we have plot element, which is equal to that dumb element, which is the plot, it's an empty section. And the next thing that we have is that whenever the data changes, uh, I'm just checking if there's a date, if there's data, right? In this case, data is an array. If there's data, then I'm going to create a new plotly plot. I'm going to pass the ID of the plot element I could have hard-coded the, the plot ID here and potentially taken this, out of, this line out of here. But I figure, why not, if you want to reuse it for other purposes, right? We pass the data input. So this data equals to the data that you're passing through the attributes through here. So depending on the context or where this component is being used in, uh, data is going to be equal to, an, you know, it's going to be bound. It's going to have data layout the same. So we're creating a new plot with the plot ID with the data and the layout that we need. Now, you actually don't want to change to create a new plot every time the data changes. Uh, in this example, when the component initializes data, doesn't have any value, it makes an index request, it gets the data, right? and then the data changes. So th this is why I'm using it in this example. But what is important to know here is that we could leverage things like ng on init, ng on changes, ng view after init, in order to understand when things are available for us to use and, how, and when to execute things. Things that would be specific to the API, or the chart library that you're using. Plotly is just one of them. And that's all for this WebGL. So this is way less code than before. Because we have a library, of course. That library is doing a lot of things for us. Uh, I'm going to very quickly just show you if I call a function, um, if I call a function that's going to change my data values, uh, where do I have it? This function just has a, a set interval, it's just gener uh, randomizing the data values. So it's going to happen, just, it's going to very slowly just transform the values and move those, do uh, move those dots. Angular 2 is, is going to pick up those data changes. And as you can see now, they are creating a new plot in this case. Next steps for this project would be uh, to only uh, re-render the data, not create a new plot. Um, so that's something that I'm going to do some other time. Any questions so far for WebGL? OK, great. Now, um, if I have more time, I would like to show you a more complex example doing very smooth data visualizations in real time. Are you guys up for it? Yeah. All right, so let's do it. So on my free time, I work on a project that takes um, brainwaves and displays it in real time uh, in an Angular 2 app. I'm using a library called uh, Call smoothie charts. And one of the things, one, one of the ways you're representing brainwaves is uh, in a time series. 
Uh, so I'm pretty sure you've seen something like this before where it's just reading uh, the positive and negative values uh, on X amount, let's say, of channels. In this case, we have eight channels. Uh, they are coming from different parts of your head. Um, they're actually captured and parsed in node, sent to the front end with sockets. So I'm going to show you how you use sockets to get the data, re-render those values uh, in a smooth way. So Smoothie is an awesome project that uses Canvas uh, and helps a lot with this data visualization challenge. Let me show you how it works first. So what I'm going to run is a simulated version. I didn't bring the headset today, but I'm going to show you um, the actual simulated data. So right now, this is just simulating the data, sending it to the sockets. And the app should be picking up this uh, information right now. So I'm going to come here, run the app. This is still Angular 2. And as you can see here, this is live data. It doesn't change anything if it's being simulated or it's actually streaming from the headset wirelessly. It performs the same. In this case, you can actually see the voltage here being updated. And, and that actually happens in real time. Uh, the colors are old. Uh, the colors are handled by the library, but I'm using, I'm leveraging Angular 2 a lot to really lay things out, to, to have, to, you know, to use this, its change detection mechanism here. Um, and they're working together seamlessly. And this is because of the Angular 2 component life cycles, uh, its performance. I built the same app in like, five or six different ways. I use Angular 1, I use Angular 2, I use Angular 1 with Google Charts, with Charts.js, with Smoothie. I have like six or seven different re uh, recipes. So far, this is the one that works the best. So let's see how that's built in Angular 2. It takes more code because this is more complex. But it's not too hard. Um, in this case, You've seen element reference. You've seen uh, on uh, on init on destroy. It's for for performance reasons. Once the component is destroyed, we're going to be killing the socket event listener. So that's something that Angular help help us do. And then we have the library. This is all library specific. It's smoothie chart and, and time series. Uh, then we have some uh, services and some constants that are custom made, and we're using sockets here. How many of you guys have used WebSockets? Oh, awesome, yeah. So I know there's a lot of different technologies just working together. Uh, so if you haven't used some of them, it's OK. This is also all open source, and you can even see the comments of how it got to the point and everything. So we have a selector. We have a template URL. We have styles. There's not much CSS, only for, like, uh, for layouts. We have some providers. Uh, I haven't updated this to the latest Angular yet. That's why you are, are going to see some things like the module ID and providers in this component, where maybe providers should go in the ng modules. But don't mind that. It's very similar. Um, OK, so this is the container template. It has ng class. We've seen ng class. We have a canvas element that we're targeting directly. So the library expects you to provide the canvas element and then to tell it where it is. And uh, I just have a loading indicator. If there's amplitudes, then you know, it's not loading anymore. OK, so let's analyze this class. This class implements on init, like we saw before, but it also implements on destroy. Then we have dependency injection. In this case, element reference, but also my chart service, my constants, and my socket um, class. So far, so good. I grayed out this part here because this is not very relevant to the way I'm building this, but we basically want to create a new instance of the smoothie chart class. We want to pass the option that is like expects, right? Like what is the width, what is the height, things that you know you could set whatever you want. And then we have amplitudes and timeline. Amplitudes are basically those values going up and down. So we have a bidimensional bidimensional array, an array of arrays, so an array with eight arrays each one of those eight arrays that contain a value. 
and those values are being updated over time, and Sockets is the one making sure this uh, data structure is updated accordingly. The timeline is just uh, what you saw, like the, the time, like minus 18 seconds to zero, right? And then we have lines, which is eight lines. I'm just creating an array with eight lines, and I'm just creating an instance of the time series that the library expects. When the component is ready, I'm adding the time series lines. So basically, this is library specific, and I'm going to walk you through it. Let's see what add time series lines is about. For each one of those channels, so eight times, this is going to basically create Right, this is going to add a line with the stroke of the call that I'm specifying. So this is basically initializing each line in the library, nothing else, right? And then we're listening to our socket events, and we're saying uh, when, whenever we get an event from sockets, in this case node, we take that data object and we update our amplitudes, our amplitudes with the data amplitudes. We update our timeline with our data timeline. And we append this to the chart, to the smoothie. Now, what append is doing, it does the same thing as instantiating them. But in this case, it sets the current value of the date time, right? I mean, the current now value in the date format, um, and the actual amplitude for each one of the channels. And I believe that's pretty much it. I mean, I'm doing an NG on destroy for the sockets. Uh, it actually helps a lot with the performance. If you have, if you're switching routes and components are being created and destroyed, and those events keeps being instantiated, you're going to pile up those events. It's going to overwhelm the client and it's going to make the app really slow. So this is actually gold here. Um, that's it. The the rest is just Angular specific. Uh, syntax for like some colors for some of like the amplitudes and things like that. But that was everything in order to get this one here running like this. Uh, the same way I'm doing some frequency lines, but this is actually with another library. This one is with uh, ng charts. We have some frequency waiters, just a different layout. We have some frequency bands. Um, and as you can see here, uh, even the DOM version that I showed you earlier performs a little better. In this case, it's because I need to tweak the animation so it fills the gaps. Um, so don't underestimate the DOM when you, like, I could actually use that component to power this, and it might look a little better. And maybe no library, right? So this is what I wanted to show you guys today. Um, If you guys have any questions, um, I'll be happy. Yes, sir. Can you repeat that again? The lines are, yeah, it is a canvas element. If you want to drill down, yeah. The library doesn't have that, the, uh, the option of drilling down. Uh, other libraries, they do. In my case, I didn't need a drill down um, because what I'm going to do is that I'm going to be using some filters to the left here uh, just to basically. So I'm, I'm not following how you want to drill down. Like, is drilling down it expanding and collapsing the actual lines? Yeah, so this is not something that I, I needed to do. I've seen that in other libraries. Uh, but, and those libraries also use Canvas, so it, it, it is possible. I just decided not to add it to my project. Yeah, it, it is possible though. Yes, sir. And how about like, when I, I should use Canvas, in your opinion, and when I should use SVG? Because I think related to the question he had is like accessibility, for example. Yeah. You cannot get into the semantics of the elements inside the Canvas, right? Yeah. Good question. When should you use Canvas? When you should use SVG? I would say it depends on your use case. If your data visualization, like what story do you want to tell when it comes to accessibility from a data visualization? 
do you want to have a container that have the right area that basically tells what it is? Or, or do you want to actually speak out the values, how things are changing? Um, I would say, um, I'm not sure if this is possible, but is, is there a JavaScript API for these type of things? So one of the things you can do is you can put the content you want to be accessible inside the canvas tag itself in the DOM. That's a good point. Inside there won't actually be rendered on the screen, but a screen reader can have access to that. So like, you would use a canvas in cases where the visualization is so complex that really describing the visualization itself is not beneficial, but describing some of the data may be. And so that you would have a separate you know, divs or whatever it is inside there that you put your area stuff on to describe what it is that's being displayed. Yeah. Thanks, Jay. Yeah. What he said. <laughs> Thanks. I've never done this, by the way. <laughs> I, I, I asked the same question when Canvas came out, and that was the answer, supposedly. So. Yeah. Yes. For your chart, for the chart, you just render how can you capture a screenshot and export to your screen? How can you capture a screenshot? Um, I think there's an API for that, uh, JavaScript API to get the, the current uh, Canvas. Um, Snapshot. Um, I remember, but I've done it before. Say again. Yeah, get data. Like, yeah. Get user data. Per yeah, there, there, there is a method on the Canvas object in order to do that. It is possible. External CSS. It would only grab the canvas, right? We had to do exactly this thing in Netflix, and it was what we actually had were rendered SVG things that we had to then deal with. And what you end up doing is this is crazy, but I had to go through and uh, basically copy the HTML out of the or the SVG rather from the SVG, and uh, while doing so, uh, have a whitelisted set of CSS properties that. I to, Jeez. to get the, you get all the computed styles off of everything, uh, actually inline them on the, the items themselves, render them into a canvas, then to again get data from the canvas, pull it out, take that, create a blob URL from it, and get okay, user data. Yeah, to, to get the actual data out of it, and then you can send that. I had to take it and send it back to the server as a file. So Is that balance of what you're showing the canvas and what you have in your in your page that you also want to capture, right? Yeah. It's, it's uh, the 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 least performant part was crawling the the DOM and figuring out what style. Looking at the computed style because there's thousands of computed styles that could exist on any given. Yeah. Item. So you have to use a whitelist to make it perform Yeah. I'll do a <laughs> Thousands. <laughs> Good amount of code. No. Actually, it wasn't that bad. It wasn't. It wasn't too bad. I would say it was probably less than 200 lines of code to get all that done. So. Hmm. <laughs> or a command, yeah. You, you had a question, so, right? You had a question? No? Not anymore? All right. Any other questions? Yes? I'm asking for a friend. Why didn't you use observables? Why didn't I use observables? <laughs> You're asking for a friend. Is your friend in the crowd? All right. Um, the, 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 the honest answer is like, I didn't know better. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you should have. I should have. Refactor. Refactor, yeah. Pull request, please. Yes. <laughs> you talked a lot about <laughs> Angular performance, and you tried different things. Did you try React? If I try React, uh, I've used React for a lot of things, not data visualization. Um, in, my, in my case, uh, the reason why I didn't try React for data visualization for this project is that because data visualizations are only one part of this project. Uh, Angular was covering all the use case, all the other use cases that I had for this project, so um, I decided to also use it. And since I got the great benefits, uh, I stuck with it. And you know, this project has migrated from probably like beta versions to like the way it is now. So I've also seen increasing performance I've, as I've been upgraded, uh, upgrading like minor versions to like more of a, like an RC almost final. Yeah. Uh, have you done a lot of React data visualizations? Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll be happy to see any projects that you have uh, up there in you know, GitHub. Uh, it's always good to try all sorts of, of, of things. 
Right. What else? Thank you so much, guys.